Welcome back to Land of Bourbon and Bad Decisions. This is the Tyler Morgan Show. Finally, finally live on Twitch. Uh, last couple of weeks, I've had some issues with my audio. I've got it repaired. So if you are waiting for video to be uploaded to YouTube, waiting for video to go to Rumble, trying to watch the replay on Twitch, and you haven't been able to, I apologize. I have been... Uh, I've been remanded to just doing audio only the last couple of weeks, which as a hell of a way to start off a new year for a podcast when you're trying to expand your video and all that. So, uh, so if you're watching this for the first time on YouTube or rumble, please find that subscribe button somewhere down there. I don't have any things popping up over my head here because honestly, I'm a little too lazy to figure all that stuff out, but it is what it is. Um, so before I get into talking about coffee and all that is good, I'm going to warn you. On this episode, I'm going to be discussing um, horrible crimes against children. And so if you're listening to this, you normally listen with kids because, hey, this is a PG-13 show. And you know, man, he doesn't say anything too offensive. My kids are old enough to handle it, blah, 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 whatever. Um, Listener discretion is advised on this one. So just putting that out there now, you have been forewarned. So now I'm going to go talk about something really good, something I love almost as much as these amazing beverages above my head, and that would be coffee. Yes, that's right. Coffee, the finest beverage in all the lands, and my favorite coffee comes to me out of Iowa at American Pride Roasters. Yes, American Pride Roasters, custom roasting coffee to order for a number of years now. Um, Dave and the guys up there and Faith, all of them, they put their hearts and soul into this coffee. They select the best beans from around the world, order them, they get them in, they roast them, they, they come up with amazing flavor combinations, whether you like Flavored coffee, dessert coffee, so to speak. They've got that. If you like your coffee to have a hint of bacon, they have the Doc's Bacon Blast, which is pretty stinking good, let me tell you. Or if you just if you're like me and you just like coffee, you like your coffee, you want the flavor forward, you don't want it buried under uh, flavorings. They have so many so many great flavors of just plain coffee. Uh, the big ones I'm into. The Frederick Douglass, the the Teddy Roosevelt, um, the I say it every week and it's slipping my mind. Um, the uh, Thomas Paine and Thomas Paine it, it's got two different blends. Um, you you can get the Common Sense, or you can go for the Age of Reason. The Age of Reason I personally like is one hundred percent robusta beans and. Uh, the Robusta beans, they're not as flavorful as, say, Arabica beans, but they've got way more caffeine. And honestly, I think the caffeine with the Robusta flavor is amazing. That's just me. Try it out for yourselves. Go to AmericanPrideRoasters.com or APRCoffee.com if you don't like typing so much. Check it out. See what flavors they have. See what you want. See what you want to try out. And then order you a bag. And then at the uh, special instructions, tell them that you heard about it from the Tyler Morgan Show. That way they know I'm still pitching their amazing product without pay. Because ACAST has said that I cannot accept payment for advertising and be able to monetize on their platform. Please put the gun away, ACAST guy. Please, please, please don't do it. So anyways... Go check out American Pride Roasters, some of the truly best coffee, and doggone it, help support small business. That's a big thing. Good conservative company, support them, help them out. American Pride Roasters, historically great coffee. All right, so if you missed the disclaimer... Because you're listening to this on podcast, you should have already heard it. I'm putting the disclaimer out again. 
I'm going to talk about stuff that is kind of disturbing. Stuff that involves crimes against children. If that is not your cup of tea, I suggest you turn off this podcast now and wait till next week's episode or um, just keep hitting that skip button or drag to about the, somewhere around the second half of the podcast. That way you can miss it because I think I need to talk about it. And it's... Uh, Getting some weird first-time chat stuff. It's a bot. Hi, I want to offer promotion to your channel, viewers, followers, views, chat bots. The price is lower, blah, 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 blah. Don't care. The joys of live streaming. But, like I said, this is an important topic. It needs to be talked about. And I'm probably going to make somebody mad here in the... I Not necessarily in the comments for the live stream, which I need to play around, see if, see if I can get those pop up on the screen so I can share what's being said with you all. Anywho's, I digress. Someone's going to get mad, I'm sure. But I don't care because things that are worth talking about, it's worth pissing people off. So, now that you have been twice forewarned, I'm going to get into it. And hopefully you won't be as absolutely disgusted as I am. All right. So this goes back to, was it June or July of last year, when two very prominent members of the Atlanta LGBTQQIA2 plus ad infinitum community were arrested for sex crimes against children. Now, I'm not making a blanket statement that all homosexual men are out, you know, committing predatory acts against children. However, these two specifically were. And on top of it, it was the against the two children that they had adopted. And, and, and that's bad. I mean, the night that they were arrested in, um, the night they were arrested, their sons had to have medical treatment due to injuries from abuse. I will say that. And this is just absolutely disgusting. Um, uh, Mia Cathel, Cathel, I don't know, I've reached out to her at townhall.com because I would love to have her on at in a long form one-on-one interview. And her reporting on this has been absolutely amazing. She has put together a four part series as an invest as an investigative report, looking into how this happened, who did it, why it was allowed to happen. And honestly, it's just disgusting. Uh, Kim is hanging out in the live chat. She says she tapped out after reading the first part of the story and couldn't bring herself to read the other three parts. I was trying to get get read through the other three part or the last two parts um, this evening, and there are so many questions. But this whole idea... Again, I, I'm putting this out there. I'm not making a categorical statement against all homosexual men that they are pedophiles. There are there are definitely those in the community, just like there are those in the straight community. And anyone who preys on children, well, there is a special, there is a, a special punishment awaiting for you in hell, I am sure. And this whole idea that the left has been freaking out on town hall, saying everything is just blatantly homophobic and all this. And like, no. Uh, 
no one around this ar- these articles in town hall has said anything categorically condemning the gay community. Have not. Everything has been condemning these two men. Uh, the Zulocks, I don't care enough to go back and find their first names. But it has just been so heartbreaking to read. But just background, uh, the Zulocks, they got married. And in 2018, they went to a Christian adoption agency that specializes in placing children with special needs whether that is physical disability, whether that is uh, mental disabilities, these are emotionally disturbed children, children that have uh, special requirements such as due to the nature of them going into the foster system, they have to stay paired. They cannot be split up. That's all well and good. I understand that. And I can say that because my older two children, they're adopted. Uh, the Missouri Baptist Children's Home, they were con- they were contracted by the state to handle their case and their placements, and eventually they ended up with us, and they helped to facilitate the adoption. So, okay, that seems all well and good. But with our older two kids, it took roughly a year and a half to two years for everything to get done, for rights to be terminated, for and then for the actual adoption to go through. However, with them, their adoptions seem to be rushed, almost like it was an intentional thing. I don't know. And, oh, wow, the live chat's uh, being, is trying to be all Captain Censor. They're making me, they're making me have to moderate a comment from Kim. I hope those boys get counseling ASAP so they don't end up like my cousin who committed suicide after he was molested. They highlighted molested. It's not the comment, slit his wrist. It is molested. Gee, Twitch. Yeah, I'm allowing that, stupid morons. Of all the dumb things to censor. But anyways, so this Christian agency really seems to have rushed through in a matter of months. Um, And... You know, our youngest son, he is also adopted, but, yeah, and he's, his adoption, it went faster than the older two. It still took almost a year. We, we finalized his adoption when he was 11 months old. So, there, there there's things that happen. Um... That sometimes these things go faster than others, okay. But when you start looking into the background of these men, and I use that word very loosely, I don't want to call them parents. Because parents don't do this to their kids. Um, One of them, like I said, he had a... Uh, accusation of doing very bad things to another boy, a child, in 2011. Now, that is, uh, I know what you're thinking. Oh, well, that should have showed up. Well, yeah, you would think, but that makes you wonder about the government bureaucracy. Did they see a couple guys who seem to have everything together and... Okay, Kim clarified that uh, her cousin survived. He did not die. So, that's good. 
I apologize for just seeing seeing that phrase and assuming my bad. But you know, while charges were never filed, the uh, the claim of abuse was never written off as unfounded. So now it's taking these current crimes, these current accusations, and now the sheriff's department's going back and looking into the 2011 allegations. And again, if this should have been stuff that was available to, you know, the uh, the Georgia Department of Family Services when they did their background checks. But I guess because he was never arrested, he was never fingerprinted in connection with committing a sex crime against a child. So anyways, you fast forward. The adoption is done. It's a matter of months. And they got caught because they were transmitting images of them abusing the children. Uh, so, many, so many horrible euphemisms they have to use here. It's because I don't want to say what the acts were. It's just that disgusting. Sending photos of these acts that they're committing against these children to a friend and essentially pimping them out. I mean, if that is not the ultimate definition of child sex trafficking, what is? And then, you know, when this guy got caught, I mean, he immediately, you know, flipped state's evidence. He said, oh, no, 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 no. This is where I got it from. This is who gave it to me. Then the process... Uh, during the investigation, they found that um, you know, they had another potential client doing that in air quotes. Um, they had another potential client lined out that they met on Grinder, And you, you just have to wonder. How how big was the ring that they were operating? How many people were they pimping these children out to? And how did it go on for so long? I get it. People get involved in that. And, you know, people who are involved in the gay community, they don't want to... They don't want to talk about stuff that happens because, you know, it makes the whole community look bad. Um, look at Christians when confronted with, you know, a big name pastor who gets caught up in any kind of, you know, sex crimes, whether it's, you know, a rape, whether it's assaulting a member of the church, whether it's against children. I mean, if they, people don't talk about it. You don't see a lot of Christian people out there talking about Josh Duggar and all of his child porn that he had on his work computer. You don't. And just because why? If we talk about it, then we have to acknowledge that these bad things happen in our communities. Now, I'm talking about this because, you know, as a conservative, if I say all lives matter, I, I, you know, immediately discrediting the Black Lives Matter movement. No, their lives matter too. Know whose lives really matter? Baby lives matter. And it doesn't matter if these children were 11 and 9 years old. They are babies. 
and their lives matter more than anything in the world. And they have been they have been broken for the rest of their lives. The idea that they were taken in by two people who supposedly loved them. And they turned around and did this. They used these boys for their own depraved sexual gratification. And then turned around and started selling their bodies to other people for their depraved gratification. It's disgusting. And I would say these people all deserve the death penalty. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in 2008, when Louisiana passed a law saying that, you know, repeat sex crime offenders, specifically repeat child sex crime offenders, they can be put to death. I think it's a reasonable law. But our illustrious Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't, you, that, that goes against the Eighth Amendment, against cruel and unusual punishment. They didn't kill nobody, so you can't kill them back. Um, excuse me? And I can't even read the whole, you know, opinion. But Sam Alito, he wrote the dissent. And it was scathing. And, and this is reading from his dissent. A major theme of the court's opinion in that is that permitting the death penalty in child rape cases is not in the best interest of the victims of these crimes and that society at large. In this vein, the court suggests that it is more painful for child rape victims to testify when the prosecution is seeking the death penalty. The court also argues that, quote, a state that punishes child rape by death may remove a strong incentive for the rap, for the rapist to not kill the victim, end quote. And may discourage the reporting of child rape. These policy arguments, whatever their merits, are simply not pertinent to the question whether death penalty is, quote, cruel and unusual, end quote, punishment. With respect to the question of the moral depravity, is it really true that every person who is convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death is more morally depraved than every than every child, than every child rapist? Consider the following two cases. In the first, a defendant robs a convenience store and watches as his accomplices as his accomplice shoots the store owner. The defendant acts net recklessly, but was not the trigger man and did not intend the killing in the se- in the killing. In the second case, a previously convicted child rapist kidnaps, repeatedly rapes, and tortures multiple child victims. Is it clear that the first defendant is more morally depraved than the second? This is ridiculous. The whole idea that you know, a serial killer, they can be they can be put to death if, you know, the state allows it. But a serial rapist, a serial child rapist, which is, you know, worse than a serial rapist of adult men and women. Don't get me wrong. 
That guy is just as bad, and he is as deserving to have a rope put around his neck and strung up from a friggin' tree, and not even quickly killed, allowed to suffocate over a course of minutes. The whole idea of a firing squad, the whole idea of electrocution, the gas chamber, lethal injection, it's all, all too good for someone who would physically and sexually torture a child or a man or a woman. But no, because they didn't commit murder, we can't kill them. It's an insane and asinine argument. These men in Georgia, they deserve nothing short of being beaten to death with a lead pipe. I know, I know. I'm probably going to run afoul of YouTube because I said, beat the child rapist to death. It won't hurt my feelings. I'm not monetized on YouTube. I don't have enough followers there. Please follow me on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button today. I might piss off Apple and Spotify, iHeart. I honestly don't care. Because if I'm going to advocate for the death penalty for anyone, you know what? Maybe it does save a state more money in the long term to house a convicted killer until they die of natural causes. Maybe it's cheaper. Maybe maybe it's more humane to let them live the rest of their sorry, pathetic lives behind bars where they can never harm anyone in society again. Maybe that, maybe that is just... I don't know. But the whole idea that you can give a life sentence without parole to someone who would do such gross bodily harm to a child. A grown man being raped can defend himself unless unless his body goes into shock or his brain goes into shock and... He can't. Same thing with a grown woman. A grown woman can defend herself. She can fight back unless her body or brain goes into shock trying to comprehend what the hell is going on. But a child? A child can't. A child is the ultimate victim of a sex crime. And anyone who would use a child as nothing more than a sex toy that will not fight back because that is how they get their jollies. That is how they are able to seek the release that they're after. I have zero sympathy. Take them out to the desert, bury them up to their necks, and cover their heads in honey. String them up from trees. Crucify them to freaking electric poles. I don't care. They are depraved. They are disgusting. And as with one of those men arrested in Georgia, they will do it again and again and again until they are arrested or dead. I want to talk to you about Keto Chow. Keto Chow is a small company out of Utah that uses the absolute best ingredients to make the absolute best weight loss products available on the market. Their first goal is flavor. Who wants to drink something as a meal replacer that tastes like crap? Keto Chow understands that this is a hard barrier for a lot of companies to break through, so they have some of the best flavors. Cookies and cream, chocolate, vanilla, real strawberry. 
These are the best shakes I've ever had. I've been using them for a few months now and they are amazing. So go to the link in the show notes, check it out. You can search for recipes on how you can use their Keto Chow products to make amazing foods that taste amazing and help with your weight loss goals. KetoChow.xyz, Keto Made Easy. Drizzly is the leading home alcohol delivery service available. Imagine being able to sit at home and pull up your smartphone and browse your favorite wine, beer, spirits, and then have it delivered to your home in as little as one hour. Go to drizzly.com or check out the link in the show notes and start shopping today. Not available in all areas. Please drink responsibly. Drizzly.com. All right, so I had that little commercial break there to uh, collect myself and pour me a nice, uh, nice glass of Jim Beam. This will at least help me calm down, get through the rest of the show. So, before I get into um, the possibility of the second Mexican American War, last week I, I. kind of briefly mentioned the show on HBO Max, Velma. Now, everyone loves a good Scooby-Doo show. You know, we all know the characters. Velma Dinkley, Freddie Jones, Daphne, can't remember her last name because never really think about it, and Shaggy, or by his given name, Norbert. Um... But trying to watch this show is, and I say try, I made it like 10 minutes. They, ooh, oof. Now, I get it. Mindy Kaling of, you know, from The Office, The Mindy Project, and several other things that she's done. The Voice of Disgust on Disney's Inside Out. Um... She did this show, and I get it. It's you're, you're doing it on HBO Max. You want to make it TVMA because you want to be more edgy for a mature audience. There's a reason I only made it about 10 minutes. You have to keep in mind, the show was set when they're in high school. It doesn't say what year, what year they are. It doesn't say their ages, so it's safe to presume they're somewhere between the ages of 15 and 18. The opening sequence is Daphne going into the gym or going into the locker room to shower after gym or sports activity, you name it. And you have animated portrayals of possibly underage, you know, teenage girls in the showers. They are censored, sort of. Um, they, they do have soap on the breasticles that cover the nipples. And it doesn't show anything below the waist in the front. And, yeah, there's some meta humor to it. Ah. Uh, Daphne looking at the other girls in the shower. Don't you just hate on pilot episodes when they have uh, when they have gratuitous sex and nudity just to build a following? Right. And then they end up in a fight. It's like, this is somebody creating a wet dream for pederasts. And forget, forget the, uh, the recasting at, you know, Daphne is Asian. Uh, Velma is, is Indian. Norbert, better known as Shaggy to the rest of us who grew up with him. He's black. And 
a total simp for Velma. And then you have Freddy. Freddy is the quintessential unwoke, unaware. Ha, I am an alpha male. Ha, 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 ha. He's that guy. Completely socially ignorant. And it's just like, really? Really? You know, Velma is, you know, her, you know, her mom went missing. You know, her dad knocked up a waitress at a diner, which yes. And then he goes out and he buys a camera so he can take very kind of raunchy uh, pregnancy photos in the dining room. Again, just enough censorship to call it censorship. It's gross. Um, you have Daphne, and Daphne is a lesbian being raised by lesbian moms who are also the only detectives in the town police force. It's it was completely unwatchable. Like I said, I made it like ten minutes. It is so popular, even amongst their own intended viewers that it has a Rotten Tomato score of seven. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I think it I think it's just over fifty percent on the critic score. I mean, how Mindy, how do you screw up something that badly? I get it. You're coming at it from a certain political agenda. You like throwing in the white guy, white dong, small dong jokes. I got it. But how much awareness do you have that in order to push a social agenda... You're going to make a show that is so awful that even your own side is like, dude, I can't watch this. It was so bad. I eat even the quality of the writing as far as the conversations. You know, forget, you know, forget completely taking the characters and and changing their changing their races. Okay. It's a different take. That's cool. I mean, for years when they made movies about Jesus, they used a white guy. And then it's not until they make the movie Chosen or the TV series Chosen, you have They use someone who actually looks like he's from that part of the world. And history has rewritten a lot of people as different colors. I mean, everyone everyone thinks of Beethoven as a white guy. The closest to white that he possibly was, was Mulatto. Because he grew up, you know, because he was born of Moorish descent. Fun fact. I mean, St. Augustine, he was, he was from North Africa. He could have been brown. He could have been black. I don't know. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's gone both ways. Oh, let's make these characters who have traditionally been white, let's make them black. You know, the, the whole idea that Idris Elba brought up when you know, they were looking for a new James Bond before they signed uh, Daniel Craig, that he didn't want to be remembered as the black James Bond. So, I mean, so, yeah, it's kind of edgy already when you take characters who are firmly established in, you know, the, the current zeitgeist and you change their races, you know, so that way... You know, people will better identify with them. Okay, that's cool, but... And I can kind of see easing some of the uh, social justice crap you're wanting to pull into it. But when you 
take potential viewers on both sides of the argument, whether they're, you know, you know, the small dong energy white guys that you're making fun of Fred for being, or it's people on your side of the argument, yeah, we need we need more inclusivity and we need this, that, and the other. When you hit them in the face so hard with your agenda that you're scoring a 7% from viewers on Rotten Tomatoes, you're screwing it up. You're, you're not just changing, you know, the skin color. You're, you're completely taking the nature of who these characters are and throwing it away. You're tossing out almost 60 years. I say almost 60 because I don't know the exact year that Scooby-Doo debuted. So almost 60 years of culture and just to make a point. So it is my highest, highest recommendation that do not watch Velma. If you subscribe to HBO Max, just avoid it like the plague. You can probably find something better. And there's a lot on there. You probably, I guarantee you can find something better. I recommend Westworld. It's very well done. But anyways, uh, I, was, I had to talk about it because, like I said, I mentioned it passing. And for scientific purposes, I tried watching it last night, and bleh, it was awful. All right, so now for the second Mexican-American War. Maybe. Do, do, do. My printer's being weird, so I have to do everything off my phone. All right, so this was actually last week, but I didn't see anything about it until, like, yesterday. Um, the GOP's favorite war hawk, the uh, Cyclops John McCain, a.k.a. Dan Crenshaw, He and another Florida congressman, GOP, introduced a joint resolution to give Biden military authority to battle cartels. Congressman Dan Crenshaw of Texas and Michael Waltz of Florida introduced a joint resolution authorizing Biden to use military force to combat the cartels pumping fentanyl and other similar dangerous substances across the border. Crenshaw, the architect of the bill, Oh, he architect of the bill last Congress told Fox News Digital that the cartels, quote, are responsible for about 360,000 homicides this year in Mexico, end quote, and that they are militaristic in nature, mirroring an all out civil war in many cases. The Texas Republican also said the same level of cooper- said the same level of cooperation America saw with the Colombian government under former President Clinton isn't being mirrored by Mexico to the extent it needs to, and that the big difference between the situation and today's is the fentanyl factor. What we've been dealing with for a while now, and nobody wants to talk about too much, is a potentially failed narco-terrorist state at our border, Crenshaw told Fox News Digital in a Wednesday phone call. And when you have 80,000 Americans a year dying from fentanyl overdose, oftentimes not even knowing they were taking fentanyl, That, to me, is active hostilities against the American people. Crenshaw said that he did not believe the Mexican government's claim that the son of El Chapo's arrest was not related to President Biden's visit, that the U.S. needs to to pressure them to do more. They can do more. Under President Trump, they were shown that they would do more if we leveraged them. And this is some pretty serious leverage. The congressman also said the joint resolution is not some messaging bill, and is a very serious conversation about what needs to be done to address this threat. The Texas congressman also noted that he previously introduced the Declaring War Against Cartels Act last Congress, and that the Mexican government, quote, used to play ball a lot more, and they've done it a lot less. End quote. Crenshaw said the Mexican government is fairly transactional and fairly prone to leverage, and that the joint resolution is leverage, adding the U.S. is done having nice conversations where we all shake hands at the end and put our different flags behind us. 
We are really, really serious about this. Oh my gosh. I I am totally having images of South Park Al Gore popped in my head. Because um guys, I'm super, super serial about this. Guys, I'm serial. You have you have got yeah, you guys have threats within your country that are becoming serious threats to our country, killing tens of thousands of Americans a year, and we need to address it. So it's a carrot and a stick. We want to help them, but we need that strong language in there too. Crenshaw said that his GOP colleagues in the House are showing interest in the resolution and quipped this that his message to Democrats is he's giving the Democrat president authority to look good for the American people. Why don't you take me up on that? How about that? Because this is a problem that faces every American. This is not partisan. You know, this is not a partisan bill. This is a strong national security bill. This is what the warmongers always want to do. And and don't get me wrong. We do have a giant fentanyl problem in America. It does come across the border from Mexico. However... If we start engaging in open hostilities against the cartels in their own country, how long until Mexico decides, um, because let's face it, they are not known for their corruption-free governments at all. They are... They are fully intertwined with many of the cartels. And honestly, aside from remittances from the United States, American dollars coming into Mexico via the drug smuggling operations is one of the largest generators of wealth in Mexico. The peso is not worth a crap, but the American dollar goes a really, really long ways in Mexico. So what happens when the U.S. government says either you do something about the cartels or we're going to come in and do it for you? How long does it take? How long does it take? Before Mexico decides, uh, I don't think so, senor. And they actively start resisting our operations and start running protection for their golden calves. These cartels, we can openly declare war on them all we want. But it's going to be like the opium wars in China. Yeah, China may have lost. But when Britain declared war, it didn't and it they just didn't fold. I don't think Mexico would just be like, "All right, all right, US troops, come on in." Because there, there are no federalities anymore. Mexico had to had to dissolve the federal police force because it was so corrupt. The local police that operate within the same territory as the cartels, they're not going to get involved because you know they like breathing, and they're probably on the take, you know and doing security for the cartels on top of everything else. So, yeah, why why would they give up their cash cow as well? And frankly, we start sending troops into Mexico going after these cartels. I guarantee you, Mexico will say, I don't think so. And we'll, yes, their army is a joke compared to the United States military. Got it. But it will not take long before they start pushing back. And then next thing you know, we're having all-out military conflict 
between two sovereign nations. And in the in the world's eye, we're the bad guys because we are sticking our noses into the business of a sovereign nation. And Mexico, in, front, in the eyes of the world, are a sovereign nation defending its borders from an adversarial foreign government in a neighboring country that's trying to exert its will over it. Granted, yes, the drugs are a bad thing, but are we really willing to start a full-fledged war? Not just a war on drugs, war on poverty, war on blah, blah, blah. You know, this you know, rhetorical flourish, war on. And right now, America has gotten such a black eye from in front of the rest of the world because, you know, Afghanistan, look how, how we pulled out of there. It was a joke. I mean, we, we gave up the greatest strategic foothold that we had in Afghanistan. And now China has it. The, this whole idea of, and, and, and I can sympathize the idea of, well, if they're not going to go after them, we should. I can sympathize with this. No one wants to see their kid trying pot for the first time, and it's laced with fentanyl and they die. No one wants to see their kid at college. It's like, man, I... I can't keep up with everything. It's, I, I got some, you know, fit, I got some Adderall out, you know, from my buddy. I'm going to use that to kind of help me focus and keep going during studying on these long hours at night. And it was not Adderall at all. It was, it was fentanyl. Pressed to look like Adderall. No one wants to see these deaths. No one wants to see someone who had a legitimate injury and was put on, you know, hydrocodone, oxycodone, Vicodin, whatever, and they get hooked. And instead of getting proper pain management, instead of getting proper treatment to help get off the crap from their doctors, they turn to the street because, you know, they can get stuff so much cheaper. And they don't want to get red flagged. So that way, if they do have to go try to get an actual prescription for something, they won't be turned away. No one wants to see these deaths. No one. But the idea that you're going to go into a sovereign country and take these take these people out if that that government won't help you, that's not a very good uh foreign you know foreign policy look. Because then other countries are gonna look at us and go, Well crap, if you're willing to go into uh go into Mexico because they ain't they aren't playing ball. What if we're not playing ball on something? Are you going to cut, send your military in to force us, force your hand too? And then we end up looking like the freaking bad guys. We're the ones trying to exert our will over other nations. In the live chat, Kim said, you mean like Russia? Huh, sounds like Crenshaw is like Putin. Yeah, that's what it does sound like. Because we push into Mexico, if, how long till we start claiming those northern states as ours? And 
And we're back into the land grabbing imperialist blah 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 bull crap that we we were labeled for over a hundred years because of you know settlers convincing the Marines stationed at Pearl Harbor to go overthrow the Queen. Because, oh, these Philippine islands, yeah, we really like them. They're ours. Guam, we love Guam. We're keeping it. Puerto Rico, Porto, ours. This damn Spanish couldn't hold on to it, so it's ours now. I mean, it's not good, period. End of story. All right, so that's going to wrap up tonight's show. Thank you for those of you who join me live on Twitch. If you're watching this on YouTube or Rumble, please remember to subscribe and share the video. Get it out there. Help the show to grow on video. I greatly appreciate it. Please do not make fun of the mustache. I know I'm used to having a beard. But you know what? I want to do something different. So I stashed it up. So, oh, then for those of you who listen to the podcast, please on whatever pat, you know platform you listen on, Apple Music or Apple iTunes, Amazon Music, Pandora, I said iHeart earlier, Stitcher, Spotify. I am not on SoundCloud. Don't look for me there. I don't like SoundCloud. They're jerks. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure they're lovely people at SoundCloud, but, you know, I, I don't like trying to keep up with their numbers and adding into my numbers because they don't. their numbers don't go to you, go to this. It, it's weird. Um, whatever platform you're on, if you're checking this out and you're new, I ask the same four things every week. Please, number one, subscribe. That way you get the new show whenever it comes in. Number two, please Rate this show. Look for five stars. I'll accept four. Three and below. Hit me up on Twitter at fake Tyler Morgan or at RD Media Pods, either or. We need to have a conversation why you think this is three stars or less. Once you have rated it, please write a review. Don't get carried away. If you like the show, you fluff it a little bit, but don't get crazy. Just just a little bit ego stroking, not a lot, not a lot. Just some. And then uh, once you have subscribed, rated, and reviewed, please, number four, share this episode with a friend. Like, hey, dude, check this out. Um, The first half of this, dude, it's dark. But it it's important. You know, whatever. Again, all these things, these are all things that helps to bring new listeners to the show. And I cannot grow the show without the awesome help of you all rating, reviewing, sharing all that stuff. So again, thank you so very much for everything you do. Um, if you would like this episode, if you like further episodes that are ad free, please go to patreoncom slash Tyler Morgan show, sign up there and uh, subscribe as little as $5. It will get you ad free episodes. It will get you access to the, uh, Oh, pardon me. It'll get you, Access to the extra shots that I do every couple of weeks, kind of, yeah. Like I had one, uh, my first one for this year, I was going into some COVID stuff because that got me on the naughty list over at YouTube. So I decided, hey, instead of catching a strike because I'm quoting from articles or quoting from studies, I'm going to do it over here behind the paywall. Again, I don't, I don't like putting a lot of stuff behind the paywall, um, but, you know, there's stuff there that's, you know, extra. Like I said, you get ad-free episodes. You get, you know, the extra shots. Early access to interviews. So if Mia Cathol, if you, you know, come back, get back with me, and you want to do that long-form interview, if you're subscribed on Patreon, you will have access for almost a week out before it goes live on the uh, free on regular podcast platforms. So, again, thank you so very much for subscribing there. Uh, support the show, 
Relentlessdaring.com. Scroll down. You'll see a PayPal donation thing. You'll see a, uh, uh, coffee subscription. Well, you know, not necessarily subscription donations. You can set that up one time or recurring donations. Again, all that stuff goes into helping build the show. I can buy software, I can buy hardware. I can just, you know, pay the bills. Believe me, believe me, I am not living high on the hog off this podcast by any stretch of the imagination, but every little bit does help, you know, by fancy microphones. I would hold up my board and show you how fancy it is, but, you know, it's kind of bulky and it's wires. I'll make a mess. It's awful. Uh, Again, thank you so very much for listening, and as always, stay relentless. The Tyler Morgan Show is a Relentless Daring Media production. The Tyler Morgan Show is supported by its listeners. To support the show, go to ko-fi.com slash Tyler Morgan Show to donate there, or relentlessdaring.com and hit the donate button at the top of the page to set up your donation. All music used in the Tyler Morgan Show is used with permission from purpleplanet.com. Link in the show notes. 2 Timothy 1.7